Hello everyone, this is Dr. Pruitt. Welcome to this week's EKG. This week we have a 74-year-old male. This week we have a 74-year-old male who has a history of pretty chronic chest pain, also a history of high blood pressure and known coronary artery disease. Who had a stent placed in 2006, and incidentally, he's also got a prosthetic aortic valve. His vital signs, when you start to assess him, he's got a heart rate of 88, a blood pressure of 136 over 70. He's got a normal oxygen saturation on room air, normal respiratory rate, and a blood sugar of 139. So nothing really sticking out on his vital signs, generally appears okay. You go on and get your 12 lead, and this is what you see. Looks a little scary on your first glance, doesn't it? Okay, even though it looks scary, we're gonna still go through this pretty methodically, just like we do every time. So we're gonna start with rate, and we always look here, see what the computer thinks. The computer thinks it's a rate of 83. I'm gonna look and see if I agree with the computer, and so I always look for a QRS that lines up with a thick red line, and I see one right here, and then we count down. So we do 300, 150, 175. So this guy is somewhere between 75 and 100, which would put him about 83. I agree with the computer. We've got a rate of 83. Next thing we want to determine is our rhythm. And so first, is the sinus or is it not? We look for our P waves to indicate that it's coming from the sinoatrial node. And lead two is always our favorite place to look for those. I do see P waves in lead two. Um, and pretty much throughout the entire 12 lead, I see P waves before every QRS. I'll go ahead and call this a sinus rhythm. Next question is, is it regular or irregular? This is a quick um, test of the naked eye. Um, to me, it looks like our QRS complexes are pretty evenly spaced, just like a metronome. It looks like it's working and beating like it should pretty regularly. I don't see any wide spaces, narrow spaces. I would call this a regular sinus rhythm. Next we get into our axis. This is where we look at lead 1 and lead AVF and we get to use our thumbs for the vectors of the QRS. So in lead 1, the vector of the QRS is mostly up. We have a thumbs up on our left hand with lead 1. AVF though is mostly down. So if we take our right thumb for lead AVF and point that down, what we're left with is our left thumb up which would indicate that we have a left axis deviation. And as we move on to our intervals, this is where it gets a little bit interesting. We start with our QRS, and we're asking ourselves, is it wide or is it narrow? And our definition of wide is anything greater than 120 milliseconds. Well, here we're at 138. And just like we talked about with our right bundle branch blocks, same thing, whenever I see a wide QRS, first place I go is to lead one, V1, and I ask myself, what does that look like? Is it mostly up? Is it mostly down? I just learned from Lieutenant McGee about the blinker, uh, which is really helpful, I think. If you're in your car and you go to do your turn signal, um, if you're going left, it goes mostly down. That's where we are here, indicating a possible left bundle branch block in the setting of a wide QRS. Next, we move on to look at our QT. Normal is less than 450. We're at 466 here. I'm going to take note of that, but not be totally surprised because in the setting of a wide QRS, everything stretches out. And so it's not uncommon to have a longer QT when you have a wide QRS. And that's a little bit less pathological in terms of prolonged QT because we have an explanation for why it's long. It's long because the QRS is wide. As we move on to our ST segments, this can get a little bit difficult in the setting of a left bundle branch block because it's not uncommon to have a little bit of ST elevation going through, especially the anterior septal leads. You see that there's one or two boxes of that here. And so I'm sure you learned when you were coming through school, it's very difficult to determine ST elevation or a STEMI in the setting of left bundle. So we do see some ST elevation in the septal anterior leads that's expected with a left bundle. I don't see any necessarily, maybe a little bit inferiorly as well. Um, so it's hard to interpret, right? The other thing that we see when we look at this 12 lead is these really big deep Q waves in our inferior leads in two, three, 
and AVF. And that can indicate that there's some old myocardial damage there. Q waves are actually tissue that's infarcted and no longer gets blood flow, so it doesn't depolarize. And that manifests on your 12 lead as a big deep Q wave before the depolarization. And we know that this guy had a STEMI in 2006, and I would suspect um, probably his old STEMI was on this right side, and that's what we're seeing here is the manifestation of his old heart attack with those Q waves in the inferior leads. So what we have at the end of the day is we look at this 12 lead, we have a sinus rhythm with a rate of 83, a leftward axis in the setting of a left bundle branch block with also a first degree AV block, and then some old Q waves in the inferior leads. And when we think about left bundle branch blocks, I know you probably took a look at this 12 lead and thought, oh my goodness, this looks abnormal. Well, that's true. And typically left bundle branch blocks are a signal of a pretty sick heart. This only typically happens in our folks that have some underlying pathology that really is associated with a much higher cardiac mortality. So either they have extensive coronary artery disease, a lot of times they have had a heart attack that led to this, uh, cardiomyopathy, congestive heart failure. Um, and then interestingly, aortic regurg and aortic stenosis. And my suspicion for this patient is he probably had an aortic valve problem that led him to get the valve replaced, but it was discovered in the setting of his left bundle branch block. And so they were able to fix the valve, but it, you can't really fix the electrical conduction part of the heart, so he still has the residual left bundle. It's important to note, though, if you do see these left bundle branch blocks, one, it's difficult to identify STEMIs, but two, these patients have a much higher mortality in regards to their risk of sudden cardiac death or um, cardiac ischemic disease or congestive heart failure because if you think about it, their left side of their heart is not able to depolarize and squeeze as efficiently as it should. Just a quick note, I mentioned that it's hard to identify a STEMI on a left bundle. That's true. There is a way to do it. It's called the Scarbosa criteria. These are the modified Scarbosa criteria. Not going to go over it today. I would urge you not, you may not even need to commit it to memory. The truth is I have to look this up almost every time I'm worried about it too. Something to think about, but realize you can look it up if you need to. And the important changes you look for are con concordant changes. So if the majority of the QRS vector is up and the T wave depolarization is also up, that gives you five points for Scarbosa criteria. That's a big indicator, concordant changes in the precordial leads will really suggest that you have some ischemia going on. Also, ST depression or ST elevation greater than five millimeters. We talked about a little ST elevation being normal, but in this case, it is profound ST elevation. And those will all get you points with the Scarbosa scoring criteria to suggest that there may be some myocardial ischemia going on. Again, feel free to look this up if you need to. It's hard to commit to memory. And that is all for today for our left bundle branch block. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week.